Today's topic is the study of the history of the doctrine of righteousness by faith in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. About 65 years ago, I was a student at the Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., before Andrews University was formed. And one of the lecturers was talking in class about this doctrine and told a story that I well remember. <clears throat> when he was doing his final oral examinations at the University in Basel in Switzerland, a group of non-Adventist professors were examining him. And toward the end of the examination, one of the lecturers said, what is the most important doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And my lecturer, who was being examined, replied, the most important doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the doctrine of righteousness by faith. When the professor heard that answer, he spoke up and said, how then is it that you emphasize in your church that seventh day Sabbath the way you do. And just then, as he was about to get an answer from the seminary lecturer, the bell rang to terminate the examination. And so the one in charge said, the examination is now over. To which the other examiner said, I want an answer to my question. The man in charge said, sorry, the rules are, the exam's over, no further discussion. And so he never got the, any further information from the Adventist student. After the class was over, I approached him and asked him, did you ever get a chance to talk to that professor again after the exam and give him the answer that he wanted? He said, no, unfortunately, I did not. I had to catch a train and I had to rush from the examination room straight to the station to get my train to my destination and never had the opportunity to continue the discussion. It is rather strange that we as a church <clears throat> from time to time have still been arguing over this doctrine, the doctrine of how we are saved. For more than 150 years since our movement began in 1844, various emphases have been placed. And this study will trace some of the history of the teaching on this doctrine that we have seen in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, showing how in different times different emphases have been given and how we have not always spoken with the same voice. Even today, the issue is not fully resolved in some places. In order to do this study, we're going to look at the history starting with 1844, the Great Advent Awakening Movement led by William Miller. This movement called out people who were expecting the Lord to return. Eventually, the date of October 22, 1844, was set as the date when the second coming of Christ would be, take place according to their thinking. When Jesus did not come, the event has been labelled in history the great disappointment, for those believers were very disappointed that Jesus had not come. But following this disappoint, disappointment, two groups of people emerged. One is called the spiritualizers, who taught that Jesus did come in 1844 to the believers in order to cleanse them. An invisible coming, if you like. The main group, however, that developed into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, taught that Jesus had taken up the second phase of his sanctuary ministry in the heavenly sanctuary 
a work of pre-advent or investigative judgment, which would culminate in the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary of its record of the sins of the believers. Hiram Edson and O. R. L. Crozier, James and Ellen Harmon, later Ellen White, and Joseph Bates, who are some of the prominent people in this group. This second or main group became, began with the focus on Christ's work for us in the heavenly sanctuary. Right after 1844, we have in our history what is known as the shut door theory, a teaching held by many at that time that said that those who had rejected the awakening message that had been preached under William Miller had had their opportunity for salvation and the door was now closed to them. Fortunately, this situation soon changed as the realization dawned on the early believers in the movement that there was still a work to be done in evangelism for those who had not been in the Millerite movement. Then the Sabbath truth came to their attention and was accepted by many. This teaching made us stand out in the community as most people at that time were keeping Sunday. <clears throat> Ministers of other churches attacked us and so to defend our position we preached law and Sabbath to defend our position on the Ten Commandments. The more we preached that, the more we were attacked. And the more we were attacked, the more we defended. And the more we defended, the more we were attacked. And so the progression was law and Sabbath. Law and Sabbath. Law and Sabbath. Ever with increasing emphasis, as you see on the screen. Our men became so expert in the law and the Sabbath and frequently debating these topics with other ministers uh, succeeded in defending their position quite well. They became so expert in the law and the Sabbath that they won many debates. But as they did that, spirituality began to decline because spirituality never seems to foster or grow in an area of debate and argument. About this time, Ellen White made a statement that is very significant. To check this decline, she called for a revival, that Jesus wanted to live his life within his people. A short-lived revival did follow, but as the time passed and the latter rain did not fall as some expected, spirituality again declined. The increasing emphasis on the law and the Sabbath continued and many Adventists were living very legalistic lives. Our enemies called us legalists because of the emphasis. Ellen White once made this statement that for years she had not heard the preaching about Jesus that she wanted to hear. She said that our preachers were as dry as the hills of Gilboa, which lacked dew and rain. She said the only time that she ever heard anything about the merits of Jesus was when she and her husband James White discussed it together in their family worship. That was rather a low point in our history when we put more emphasis on law and Sabbath than we did on Jesus and what he did for our salvation. Prior to 1888, Ellen White called for revival again. At that time, we had two men, A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagoner, young evangelists, who became editors of the Signs of the Times and working out of California, became spiritual leaders in the church. Wagoner wrote a series of articles on the law in the book of Galatians that sparked considerable controversy. Even the General Conference President at that time, G.I. Butler, led out in opposition to their position. 
And these events set the stage for the conflicts that we know and have heard about in the 1888 General Conference session. During these years, ministers were preaching so much law and Sabbath that our members were hungry for something more about Jesus. At the General Conference session, the stage was set for a friction and debate. Before the session proper began, there was a series of ministerial meetings for the pastors. And in these meetings, debate raged over the question of what nations constituted the ten horns of, Revelation, of Daniel chapter 7. There was disagreement there. There was disagreement over which was the law that was mentioned in the book of Galatians. And so tempers began to fray so that in these meetings, harsh words were sometimes uttered by various antagonists against each other. Wagoner had been teaching that the law in the book of Galatians was the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ and that that law was the Ten Commandments. Others were saying that it was the ceremonial law and that probably was a more common position at that time. In the general conference session itself, Jones and Wagner led out in a study of righteousness by faith. Ellen White supported them, saying that their message was a precious message from the Lord. However, many of the older workers opposed them, including Uriah Smith and the General Conference President. When Uriah Smith received a rebuke from Ellen White, he withdrew his opposition. Some supported the young men, some supported the older men. Many sat on the fence, not knowing which team or which side to support. The opposition of the older members was based upon the fear that if we were to preach righteousness by faith, we would weaken our position on the law and the Sabbath and our need for obedience to the commandments. Ellen White also spoke at Minneapolis and her lectures at that session were printed in the Review and Herald. But because of the opposition of the editor of the Signs and the Review and Herald, the sermons of Jones and Wagner were not printed in the General Conference Bulletin or in the Review and Herald. So the only way today we have to know for sure what these men said at that session is to study the articles that they wrote immediately before and immediately after the session in the magazines where they had access, such as the Signs of the Times. These articles give to us an understanding of the position they had. And while Ellen White endorsed them and said they had a precious message from the Lord, I don't find anywhere in history her, any statement from her that they had all the truth on righteousness by faith. It seems that she probably was more saying that they were moving in the right direction, that maybe there was more truth still to come. You see, Ellen White did say in the Review and Herald article, July 26, 1892, not long after the 1888 meetings, we have many lessons to learn and many, many to unlearn. Adventists regard truth as progressive and we don't want to claim that we have all the truth at any one point of time because the Holy Spirit can reveal more truth to us out of the Word of God that we sometimes have not noticed in the past. So in the years immediately after 1888 to 1901, in these post years, Ellen White, Jones and Wagner continued to preach righteousness by faith in the churches and at camp meetings and also at some of the general conference sessions, which back in those days was held virtually every year. 
the bitter opposition to the doctrine of righteousness by faith that was witnessed in the meetings in Minneapolis was not seen in the post-1888 years. During this time, Ellen White wrote Steps to Christ, Desire of Ages, Christ Object Lessons, and they certainly elevate Christ and his righteousness and our need of it. But then Ellen White did not publish Steps to Christ in an Adventist publishing house. Some have suggested that she published it outside with the non-Adventist publishing house of Connie Bear and Howson for fear that the editors of the Adventist Review and Herald might change some of the statements that she had written in their editorial work. So she was once asked, I believe, why she chose to put it in the hands of Connie Bear and Howson. She gave a very wise answer. She said, uh, because of prejudice against Adventists, anything published in an Adventist publishing house would be disregarded by non-Adventists. But putting it in the hands of Connie Bear and Housen, it would have a much wider circulation than if it was only printed by an Adventist publisher. And that was the reason that she gave. She didn't say it was the only reason, but maybe we are speculating. However, she did emphasize righteousness by faith in these three publications, Steps to Christ, Desire of Ages, Christ Object Lessons. But then she was invited to go to Australia. And in 1891, she moved to Australia and remained in Australia and New Zealand and <clears throat> this South Pacific area from 1891 to 1900, about nine years in all before she decided to return to America in about 1901. <clears throat> she, when she went back to America in 1901, they held a general conference session. And uh, <clears throat> at that session, the administration of the church was reorganized under Ellen White's urging. The work had grown so big that it was almost impossible to administer everything worldwide from one headquarters. So union, mission, union conferences were sent up. Union missions were organized. And the responsibility for the administration of the work was diversified so that the burdens were reduced for those who ministered in head office. During these years, Dr. Kellogg went into apostasy with teaching of pantheism. This teaching stressed that God was in everything, and it led to a swing away from the teaching that God's people physically constituted his temple. The church pressed on and was very silent during these years on the topic of righteousness by faith for fear that they were sounding a little bit like Kellogg and his doctrines. Jones, unfortunately, joined Kellogg in his pantheism. And uh, Wagoner went as a missionary to the United Kingdom, to England. And unfortunately, both these men became tainted with apostic ideas and left the ministry. Jones got dabbling into pantheism, and uh, Wagoner got into some moral difficulties, and both of them lost their ministry. I have emphasized to my students over the years that if there's one doctrine the devil hates more than any other is the doctrine of righteousness by faith because it describes for us how we are saved. And the devil doesn't want anyone to be saved. So he is at work to distort the doctrine and to cause dissension among us. I told my students, if you're going to preach righteousness by faith, beware. Because those who have championed righteousness by faith, the number of them have been taken out of the work because of apostasy in later years. <clears throat> 
we have Jones, we have Wagoner, and in more recent years, we have the example of Des Ford, who preached righteousness by faith and contributed much in that area to the church, but left the church on other theological issues. In the years 1905 to 1920, there was a drop in interest in the subject of God's people being his dwelling place. A drop in interest in the sanctuary doctrine and a decline in the preaching of righteousness by faith. We mentioned that Jones and Wagner left the ministry, both having followed Kellogg in some respects and was influenced by his Kellogg's teachings. And in 1915, uh, Ellen White passed away. In 1920 to 29, following the death of Ellen White, there came a renewed emphasis on righteousness by faith with the preaching of some outstanding Adventist ministers. Among them were Mead Maguire, A.G. Daniels, C.B. Haynes, I.H. Evans, and W.W. W. Prescott. The preaching of these men placed a heavy emphasis on sanctification. It is clear that their understanding of righteousness by faith was that it was justification and sanctification. And if you go back to the 1888 Minneapolis situation, looked at what Jones and Wagner said in their printed articles, you would find that their concept was much the same. That righteousness by faith was justification plus sanctification. That both came under the heading of righteousness by faith. In later years, there was a period of great expansion of mission work in the SDA church. Church leaders were increasingly involved in the administration of the expanding work and in trying to solve organizational problems. And this led to another decline in the preaching of righteousness by faith. <coughs> then we come to 1929, 1939. 1929 brought in the great worldwide depression, probably the greatest economic collapse that we have seen in recent decades, which put enormous strain on church administrations. Administrators tried to balance their budgets and keep the work going despite very adverse uh, economic conditions. These years saw an increased emphasis on the subject of law and Sabbath and the need for obedience. And there was very little preaching on righteousness by faith in that decade. In 1939 to 1945, there came World War II. And these years proved very difficult years also for church administration. Again, the emphasis was law and Sabbath, and very little was on righteousness by faith. I was a youth back in those days, teenager, through some of those years. And I can remember hearing the preaching of Adventist ministers at that time. We became experts on law and Sabbath and on the Ten Commandments. But there wasn't much on righteousness by faith. From 1950 to 1970, we come to a very interesting period. In the early 1950s, two men, Whelan and Short, were students at the Seventh-day Adventist Seminary in Washington, D.C. They had been missionaries in Africa, American missionaries in Africa. And they studied the events of 1888 and the General Confession of Minneapolis. And one of them, I believe, wrote a thesis on that subject and took the position that the church had rejected the message of righteousness by faith in 1888 and that the latter reign would not come until the church made a corporate confession of this sin. Church leaders did not see eye to eye with them on this subject. They said whatever sins were permitted then was charged against them, but not against us. We were not there in 1888. 
So you can't blame us for it. So why should we repent for the sins of others? In the years since then, <clears throat> there has been dialogue between them and the General Conference leadership. Today, there is an ongoing discussion taking place around 1994 with these two men, who I think have since then passed away. In the 1950s, the mid-1950s, an Australian by the name of Robert Brinsmead began his Sanctuary Awakening Fellowship in Australia. He taught a brand of perfectionism <clears throat> that would be the experience of God's people when they were sealed. This sealing was to take place, he taught, before the latter rain and the loud cry. Only a sealed group of people would give the loud cry. He placed a heavy emphasis on the cleansing of the soul temple. Because of his divergent theological views, he was disfellowshipped, but his movement attracted many followers and spread around the world. And I remember hearing him preach in Washington, D.C., no, sorry, in uh, Bering Springs in Michigan, when I was a student at the seminary, he visited and took a public lecture in a hall in the town, not at the Andrews University Center. The great champion against Brinsmead was the chairman of the theology department at that time of Australasian Missionary College, or Avondale College, as it was then called, and he became the chief spokesman for the church in opposition to Brinsmead. But in 1955, I was a student at the seminary in Washington, D.C. My graduation was coming up, and I decided that I would uh, go to the general conference office and speak to Pastor R.A. Anderson, who many years before had been an evangelist in Australia and New Zealand and was then serving as the ministerial secretary of the General Conference. My father had worked with him in North New Zealand Conference in the days when he was there, long before I was born. And because he was a friend of my father, I thought I'd invite him to come to my graduation as a stand-in for my father who was in New Zealand and unable to travel to the United States to witness my graduation. When I met with Pastor Anderson, he told me, I'm getting some material ready here for a meeting with some non-Adventist theologians. They have written to us and told us that they're planning to write a book against us. They had written one against the Jehovah's Witnesses, They've written one against the Mormons, maybe one or two other groups, and were planning to write a book against us. But they were honest men in their approach to this, their projects and said, we do not want to quote from your enemies what you believe, because maybe they are biased and maybe they distort some of the positions that you actually do take. We want to hear from your own mouths what do you believe as Seventh-day Adventists? <clears throat> when they came to meet a few days later, they said, we're not concerned about the Sabbath issue. We know what you teach about the Sabbath. We understand your arguments that you use to support it. We want to know, are you really Christians? What do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about his nature, his human nature? What do you believe about his atonement, his sacrifice on the cross? In essence, what do you believe about righteousness by faith? And as they discuss these things and our leaders explain to them what we believe in these areas, they were amazed. And they said, you, you Adventists are really Christians. Well, of course, we knew that all along, didn't we? <laughs> we? We knew we were Christians. It's too bad that some other Christian groups don't recognize that we are Christians. But they said, well, we can have fellowship with you because you are straight on these issues. And so, <clears throat> Barnhouse and Martin published an article in the Eternity magazine, which they 
printed, called Peace with the Adventists. And they lost, I believe, a thousand or more subscribers when that article came out. Non-Adventists who saw that article said, we don't agree with these men that say you can have con Christian fellowship with Seventh-day Adventists. We don't agree with that. And so they canceled their subscription. But these men took a stand. Well, of course, they gave us a series of questions and wanted our answers and asked for written answers. These answers were given. And the leaders in the general conference decided that it would be helpful to the church if they printed these answers up in the book for all our members to read. <coughs> and so the book, Seventh-day Seventh Adventists Answer Questions on Doctrine, was printed. And it created a real theological storm because there were many Adventists that disagreed with some of the things that were in that book particularly about the nature of Jesus and the nature of the atonement and when the atonement was made and issues like that and righteousness by faith and the relationship of works to salvation. Some Adventists still had a legalistic uh, hangover from the earlier days when law and Sabbath was being emphasized so heavily. And so the book created a stir and uh, one of the senior Adventist theologians Elder Andreasen rose in opposition to what was in that book. And because of his opposition and continued opposition, he uh, lost his credentials. And uh, I, the General Compass did restore them posthumously. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> it was a stormy time for Adventist theologians, I tell you. And I was in some of those years, of course, as you could appreciate. This book, probably more than any other book, gave rise to what is called, in our part of the world anyway, the Concerned Brethren Movement. And I'm sure many older Australians will remember the days of the Concerned Brethren Movement when a series of meetings was held by senior Adventist ministers supporting some of the views of Elder Andreasen and attacking those things that had been printed in the book, Questions on Doctrine. And uh, many meetings were held and uh, opposition was raised and opposition against the teaching of theology in Avondale College was raised and we had a series of meetings at Avondale College one day and being on the theology faculty at that time, I was involved in them. And then the concerned brethren didn't feel that they'd had... Uh, a fair hearing in one day, they wanted another day, so another day was held. The next day we met down in Sydney at Warunga, the headquarters, and had another two, two days of meetings with this group. And some laymen had joined in with the retired ministers. And in these meetings, <coughs> the method of operation that they used was to take statements from Dr. Ford and accuse him of heresy. Instead of taking the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy and presenting from Bible and Spirit of Prophecy sources the truth that he was teaching on these subjects, which would have taken considerable time because they had half a dozen or more issues. You could spend two or three hours on each one. He simply defended his position by quoting from the SDA Bible Commentary from Branson's book, Drama of the Ages, from Spalding's book, from other theologians of the church, and said, this is what I am teaching. Let me read it to you from the SDA Bible Commentary. And he read it from the commentary. He said, if you condemn me for what I'm teaching, that's what I'm teaching. You're condemning the commentary that the church has put out. That was his modus operandi. That was the way he defended himself. And I remember the leader of the group standing up and saying, Mr. Chairman, I am confused. I'm very confused. As a matter of fact, I am more confused than I have ever been in my life. <coughs> we bring charges of heresy against the good doctor, and he stands up there to tell us that the whole church is teaching heresy. I'm confused, and he sat down. What he didn't know he was saying was that I am not aware of what is in our church publications. I'm not aware of what is in the commentary. That was what he was saying between the lines, and he did not realize it. 
because at that time what Dr. Ford was teaching about righteousness by faith was acceptable to the church. But uh, the concerned brethren were not happy, happy with him. <coughs> Going back to the Brinsmead situation, which helped to bring on all these issues, the subjects discussed in the book Questions on Doctrine that had created the most controversy is that of the human nature of Jesus. However, after the initial outcry by some, some things settled down until the publication of three articles in the Adventist Review by Herbert Douglas. <coughs> he was a theologian and at one time was the president of the Atlantic Union College. In these three articles, he advocated the position that Jesus had sinful human nature, which was contrary to the position of questions on doctrine and contrary to the position taken by Dr. Ford and others. Brinsmead, who had stirred up this controversy in the first place, <coughs> unfortunately, discovered righteousness by faith. But instead of following it through to its logical conclusion, he went into cheap grace, out the other end, as so to speak, into an extreme position, what we call cheap grace. But, you know, I don't have to keep the Sabbath because Jesus kept it for me. I don't have to do this because Jesus kept it for me. And that, of course, is a position that we cannot support. <clears throat> At least... He has left even Sabbath-keeping himself now as a business, I'm told, which is open on Sabbath hours and sells alcohol in his shop. For many years, Dr. Ford was the champion of preaching righteousness by faith against Brinsmead and his perfectionism. In Des Ford's preaching, righteousness by faith was sanctification, full stop. Justification being the fruitage or the evidence of it, but not part of it. So in, 17, in 1974, the Review and Herald put out a special issue on righteousness by faith, volume 151, number 20, for those who want to look it up. A series of articles put out by various writers on the subject of righteousness by faith, according to the heading on the front of the magazine, Obviously, the formula that they were following in their publication in that issue was that righteousness by faith is justification plus sanctification, which, of course, was the opposite or contrary to what Des Ford was preaching at that time. I can remember, as he was my department chairman in those days, how angry he was when he saw and read that issue of the review. He wrote a letter to the division asking that we must have a meeting with the General Conference men. They are taking the church down the wrong path, he said, preaching that righteousness by faith is justification plus sanctification. Well, the brethren in the division office in Warunga, Australia, decided that perhaps it was time to asked for a meeting to clarify this issue, and so a meeting was arranged and called for. In 1974, a meeting was arranged, and a delegation went from here to Australia, uh, to America, I mean, and met with them in a place called Palmdale, in Southern California, out in the desert resort area. And there they spent a week or so discussing the issue. They examined every verse in the New Testament where righteousness by faith and righteousness of faith are mentioned or used. And they came to a conclusion. And Dr. Ford won that day because the statement put out by the Palmdale meeting was that in the Bible we agree that when righteousness and faith are linked together by of or by that the subject is dealing 
with justification, full stop. And the sanctification is the fruitage and the evidence of it. That was probably the first occasion that the, the, our church had ever made such a statement, clearly defining righteousness by faith. And it created quite a stir, as you can imagine. And as a result, there was a request made for further e discussion of the issue by a group in America uh, who had been no doubt following the formula that uh, righteousness by faith included both. So a meeting in America was called and uh, leaders went from around North America, large number of them, and uh, they met at a place called Glacier, not Glacier View. Uh, they met in the General Conference office, I understand. And as a result, this meeting was held with 145 members present and uh, they had a debate. An editorial committee of 24 members was appointed to draft a statement of how we are saved. This committee met on the 4th to the 7th of 1980 and drafted the document known as the Dynamics of Salvation. The main writer of this doctrine, of this document, was the review and editor, Dr. William Johnson. The statement is perhaps the best that our church has yet produced on the question of how we are saved. While it does not state as clearly as the Palmdale statement does, the relationship between justification and sanctification, there is in the acceptance of the position that sanctification is the result of the fruitage of righteousness by faith rather than being a part of it. This statement avoided any mention of the subject of the human nature of Jesus, as did also the Palmdale statement. That has never been officially resolved, even to this day, by the church. In Selected Messages, Book 3, pages 199 to page 200, I read, In the divine arrangement, through the unmerited favour, the Lord has ordained that good works shall be rewarded. We are accepted through Christ's merits alone. And uh, the acts of mercy, the deeds of charity which we perform, are the fruits of faith. So there's a statement from Ellen White that endorses the new formula that came out of those meetings. Righteousness by faith is justification, full stop. Sanctification, the work of a lifetime, is the fruitage of it. Our title to heaven depends on justification, not on sanctification. Sanctification is the evidence that we have received the justification that Jesus has won for us on the cross. In the years 1980, also marked the apostasy of Dr. Ford, who publicly rejected the church's position on the heavenly sanctuary and the pre-advent or investigative judgment beginning in 1844. After a very expensive hearing at Glacier View, he lost his membership, lost his credentials, and uh, unfortunately passed away some time ago. It seems to me that every time one steps out to preach strongly the doctrine of righteousness by faith, that the devil makes every effort to discredit it. Remember the fate of Jones and Wagner, and also Ford. <clears throat> the lesson is for us to beware of Satan's attacks if we are going to preach righteousness by faith, because there is evidence that the devil hates that doctrine. In 1888, 100 years after the 1888 General Conference session, the Church published a book, Seventh-day Adventists Believe, a biblical exposition of 27 fundamental doctrines. Since then, they have added a 28th doctrine dealing with spiritism. In 1940 to 1994, in the early 1990s, the General Conference put out a list of independent ministries and organizations that are not helpful to the church. Many of these groups and organizations teach forms of perfectionism and attack the church's teaching over the doctrine of salvation and how we are saved. 
I'm reminded by the statements of Eleanor White that I'm sure are familiar to all of us. The church is the object of God's supreme regard upon the earth, and he guards it with the apple of his eye. The church is going to go through to triumph in the end, she tells us. Our responsibility is to make sure that we triumph with it and that we are not led astray by various false doctrines that the devil tries to bring up. Our salvation is in Christ. That's why I think it was Bunyan said, my righteousness is in heaven, the righteousness of Jesus. That is credited to us. And as Ellen White says, the steps to Christ, the statement that we all know so well. Sinful though your life may have been, for his sake you are accounted righteous. And God then looked at you as though you had never sinned. That is good news. That is what the gospel is. It is good news. As some have said, it's good news rather than good advice. The advice is, advice is there. We are to do good works. Ephesians 4 verse 10 tells us we are born for good works. But our salvation depends upon the righteousness of Jesus, credited to us, and that is the righteousness that will get us into heaven. May God bless you. Each one is my prayer. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.